thank you all very much indeed for joining our webinar today, looking at business interruption and um, following the recent Supreme Court judgment. And my name is Andrew Forsyth and I'll be presenting along with my colleague Ashley Mobby. We're both partners in Burness Paul's insurance litigation team and I've been advising clients on insurance coverage issues caused by COVID-19 over the past year. And Ashley and I are very fortunate today to be joined by two guests working at the business interruption coalface. Um, firstly, we have Hannah McDowell, who's a manager in EY's Forensic Integrity Services team. She specialises in claims and disputes and experience includes working for a forensic accounting firm in London, working with both insurers and policyholders, quantifying business interruption losses. Um, we're also joined by Sam Ellerton, who's a regional claims leader and senior vice president at Lockton, where he manages the claims team. Sam tells me he has spent the last 10 months in a cold spare bedroom in Birmingham examining policy word wordings and challenging insurer denials of indemnity for his UK and global clients and so far securing admissions of cover in more than £15 million worth of claims. So we're very pleased to be joined by two such interesting guests. Um, before I hand over to Ashley to get the ball rolling, I just wanted to say a quick word on housekeeping. Everyone should hopefully be on mute. Um, any questions, please do drop them into the chat box and we'll do our best to get to them time permitting. We've already had a few questions in advance that we're going to try and answer as well. Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be on our website later for anyone to view. Over to Ashley. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, judging by the sheer numbers of you who are joining us today, this is a topic of, of huge interest to businesses across the, the Scottish economy and, and from a variety of sectors. So in the 40 or so minutes which we've got available today, um, what we'd like to do is, is to give you an understanding of the practical implications of this judgment for your business. So to do that, we're going to have a brief look at the path to the Supreme Court. And to illustrate the practical issues, we're going to look at a short case study, which, um, which Andrew will take you through and look at the main coverage issues coming out of that. I'm going to have a look at the impact of the judgment on quantification of financial losses which have been suffered by businesses. And to assist me with that, I'll be discussing it with Hannah McDowell. Um, and Andrew is then going to have a chat with um, Sam about um, the, the experience Lockton have been having at the co face of, of all of this. Um, and, and, and as Angie said, if we've got some time, we'll deal with any questions which come up at the end. So looking at why we are where we are today, um, for most businesses, business interruption cover is something which they purchase um, alongside property damage cover, usually in a combined risks policy. And the expectation is that that sort of policy will cover loss of income um, associated with a specific peril, such as fire or flood or storm damage. While cover, which is specific to a pandemic, is, or at least was before the COVID-19 pandemic, a product which is available in the market, most businesses don't have specific cover for pandemics. So we roll on to March 2020 and the events which we're all unfortunately so familiar with arose. Um, the UK government um, made an announcement on the 20th of March directing various businesses, including cafes, bars and restaurants, to close. Further announcements followed on the 23rd of March and regulations were passed on the 26th of March. We've of course had some further lifting and tightening of measures since then, but that's the rough timetable. The timetable was slightly different for Scotland and I'll come on to the implications of that slightly later. But businesses which have been ordered to close quickly looked at their policy and the advice which most, most businesses were getting is that in the absence of specific pandemic cover, they wouldn't have a claim. But of course, there's a huge grey area in the middle um, for most businesses, they were looking at this along the lines of, my business has been interrupted, I have a policy, why don't I have cover? And from the insurer's perspective, um, most insurers simply did not envisage covering a global pandemic with these type of policies. So recognising the huge potential for uncertainty and disputes, the Financial Conduct Authority stepped in at a pretty early stage. So on the 1st of May 2020, they announced that their intention to intervene to resolve this uncertainty for what was mainly small and medium sized businesses. And their aim was to resolve the uncertainty on the scope of cover where there is that uncertainty. So what did the FCA do? Well, they consulted with the insurance industry, um, identified policy wordings where there was a, which were a representative sample of the issues which are common across the industry. Um, they entered into a framework agreement with eight insurers who are, who are listed on the slide there. 
um, identified 21 policy wordings and raised proceedings in the High Court, seeking the Court's guidance and, uh, and interpretation of those policies. But it's estimated that the case will have an impact on around 700 policy wordings written by 60 insurers and affecting around 370,000 businesses, which is, is the headline we've all seen. And the aim of this litigation was to dis resolve the dispute on those policy wordings. It doesn't deal with the outcome of, of any specific claims. The FCA contended very broadly that the types of policies which the court was being asked to consider did provide cover for small and medium sized businesses or, or, for, or for the policy holders. So they were substantially successful um, in the High Court and, and that judgment was handed down in September 2020. Following that success in the High Court, six insurers appealed to the Supreme Court. So the judgment which we are dealing with today involved six out of the, the original eight insurers. And in relation, in relation to the aspects where the FCA were unsuccessful, they, they cross appealed. And there was a group of um, policyholders who are known as the Hiscox Action Group, which was mainly hospitality policyholders who had intervened. Um, and they, they also cross appealed. So the case we're dealing with today dealt with the interpretation very broadly of four main types of clauses, disease clauses, prevention of access clauses, hybrid clauses, which as it's, the name suggests are a mix of the two, and trends clauses, which deal with quantification of financial losses suffered by policyholders. The Supreme Court found almost universally in favour of the AFC's position on almost all aspects of the case. Well, so what? How does this decision in an English case affect Scottish businesses? Well, before we get into to, to the detail of it, which we're, which we're going to use the case study to cover for you, here are five headlines for you to take away. It is an English case, but it is relevant to Scottish claims, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, it is designed to provide guidance, which will be persuasive in, in other cases, and many of your policies will be written under English law in any event. The second headline is, the case deals specifically with the actions of the UK government and the, and the instructions issued by the UK government in March 2020 and the impact of that on policy cover. What it doesn't do is look at the later localised lockdowns or, or subsequent restrictions. They are not specifically covered in the case, although it is expected that the case will, will, will provide guidance for how those policies should be construed. Third headline from my perspective is it's good news if you have a policy either with the specific wordings which are covered by the judgment or with similar wordings. Um, but the judgment doesn't deal with, with policies which are linked specifically to physical damage to property. And finally, um, from our perspective, it, the case is good news, but it's not a silver bullet for every coverage dispute. Um, there are details which haven't been worked out in the judgment and which we envisage may at some point get, give rise to further litigation. Um, we, we, we can see, particularly on the quantification side of things, there, there are complicated questions still to be answered, and I, I, Andy will probably cover that with Lockton at a later stage. So to illustrate the specific issues um, looked at by the court, I'm going to hand over to Andrew just now to take you through our case study, which, 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 which will demonstrate these issues. Thanks, Ashley. So this, to, to try and put this all in context, we've, we've created a case study. It's a deliberately uh, sort of straightforward case study. And as you'll see, um, it's a bar in Glasgow owned by a company, which we've imaginatively called Company X, which uh, with a bar required to close on the 20th of March and has subsequently reopened and closed consistent with the changes in the law. It operated an alcohol takeaway service when the rules permitted and the bar has lost significant income as a result of lockdown, although it has cut back on some expenditure. Um, much of its workforce is on furlough um, and that furlough has stopped and started as has its business has opened and closed. And Company X has a commercial combined policy which included business interruption cover for the bar. Now that policy included the following clause, which will appear in the next slide. There we go. Um, and, and that clause wording is actually one of the clauses um, which was in front of the Supreme Court for consideration. And that's called a disease clause. And paraphrasing that, the bar needs to suffer a loss following a notifiable disease within a radius of 25 miles off the bar. And this is a pretty common policy term. Now, of course, COVID-19 is a notifiable disease in Scotland, and it has been so since the 22nd of February 2020, which is almost a year of ago. Now, in, in court, the insurers argued that a clause like this meant that business interruption losses could only be recovered 
if those losses were incurred because of an occurrence of COVID-19 within the 25 mile radius of the business. That is, cover wouldn't be provided um, if the losses were suffered because of the wider pandemic and the government response generally. It would have to be due to that occurrence within a 25 mile radius. Now, if insurers were correct on that, that would be a huge barrier for most businesses. With Company X, for example, while they'd be able to prove the presence of COVID-19 within 25 miles of the bar, and they can do that through publicly available testing data, for example, it would not be possible for them to establish that it was that localised occurrence which actually caused the bar to close. It was, of course, a government response more generally. So that issue was one of the main fighting grounds for in the High Court and in the Supreme Court. Unfortunately for our company here, um, Company X, the Supreme Court rejected the insurer's arguments. And insurance cover was not limited to business interruption, which was caused only by the presence of COVID-19 within that 25 mile radius. And in reaching that decision, the Supreme Court considered it relevant that notifiable diseases, of course, have the potential to affect a wide area as has, of course, sadly happened with uh, with COVID-19. So, in short, Company X has cover under this disease clause from the date that it can prove both a diagnosis of COVID-19 within 25 miles of the bar and resulting business interruption losses caused by COVID-19. OK, mo moving on from the disease causes, um, we then have what is commonly known as an inability to use or a denial of access clause. And again, the wording that's on the slide in front of you is wording which was considered by the Supreme Court. And, and the emphasis in these clauses in bold is, is mine rather than from the policy. But, but paraphrasing that clause, Company X will have cover for certain losses caused by the inability to use the bar due to restrictions imposed by a public authority due to COVID-19. So there are two important parts to that clause. And two important considerations that the Supreme Court had to, to consider. The first was when the clock started ticking for policyholders in claiming losses. When were restrictions imposed by a public authority? Now, was it when Boris Johnson gave the order on national TV on the 20th of March for businesses like bars to close? Or was it, as insurers argued, only when that became law later, around it was about six days later? And the Supreme Court in considering this didn't actually define what amounted to a restriction imposed and that was held over for agreement or further argument another day. But the Supreme Court did find that Boris's announcement on 20 March was certainly capable of being a restriction imposed for a clause such like this because it was a clear mandatory instruction given by the UK government which businesses would understand they, need to, they needed to comply with. And the same would surely apply to Scottish businesses, given Nicola Sturgeon's announcement on the same date. Now, an argument by a policyholder that the clock should start when the more general government advice was given to stay at home, to work from home, was noted by the court to be less strong. But as I say, that wasn't actually ruled upon definitively, and that, that may yet uh, end up before the court another day. The second important point about this clause and the second question considered by the Supreme Court was what amounts to an inability to use a premises? Does the premises need to be completely closed due to COVID-19 or not? And the Supreme Court held no, it doesn't need to be closed completely. Cover can be provided if the business is unable to use the premises for a discrete part of its business activities or if it's unable to use a discrete part of the of its premises for those activities. Either way, there's a complete inability to use. And the court gave the example of a golf club, which remained open for play, but which was required to close its clubhouse bar. So the golf club there would be unable to run a discrete part of its business, which is serving food and drink, and would therefore benefit from a clause that you see in your screen there. So for company X, although it pivoted to offering takeaway drinks and was not completely closed, for periods, that should not prevent it from claiming the losses it incurred um, due to the lack of indoor business and um, people coming into the pub and drinking there. And the result would likely be the same for Company X if the policy used wording such as prevention of access rather than inability to use. Okay. Um, before I, I, we move back on 
to looking at some quantification issues, issues I just wanted to pick up on the thread that, that Ashley started pulling on and it's worth emphasising that the Supreme Court was only asked to look at particular issues which the FCA put forward in this test litigation and the FCA did not ask the court to consider whether damaged based business interruption clauses should provide cover and on the next slide the first bullet point uh, is an example of a damage based clause so again pretty self-explanatory but it's predicated on there being damage and the, the perceived wisdom certainly is that it's going to be difficult a difficult argument to make for a policyholder that the presence of COVID-19 at a premises amounts to damage Although it might be that Sam Lockton has a view on that, which we'll which I'll ask him about uh, later on. And um, the second bullet point on that slide is an example of a policy which includes a finite list of named diseases. And whilst there's a lot of uh, high-scoring Scrabble words there, there's no mention of COVID-19 because, as a new disease, it inherently wasn't going to feature on a on a list of of diseases for for policies from last year. And again, the perceived wisdom is that if there is a, if your policy includes a finite list of diseases and COVID-19 is not on it, and there's no wording which extends it to, you know, diseases of a similar nature, for example, then you're not going to have a good argument for cover. Okay, so I'm now going to hand back to Ashley, who will look at some issues of causation and quantifying claims. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so on the slide, the next slide, which is coming up, at risk of sounding like Chris Pretty here, sorry folks, um, you should have a standard turnover clause in front of you. Um, and Company X's policy in our scenario has a standard turnover clause in it. And paraphrasing what that clause says, it says that in quantifying Company X's financial loss, um, you, we need to look at the standard turnover in the 12 months preceding the damage. And that standard turnover figure will then be, be adjusted to take account of trends in the business or variations or other circumstances affecting the business. And this type of clause is commonly referred to as a trends clause and trends clauses were looked at by the Supreme Court. Trends clauses are a standard method of quantifying a policyholder's financial loss. Standard turnover from an earlier period is compared with the turnover during the indemnity period. And plainly, if a trends clause like the one in Company X's policy were interpreted in a way um, which allowed adjustments to the, the previous comparator turnover figure to be adjusted to take account of the wider UK consequences of the pandemic, it's going to result in a very much smaller payout to Company X, um, even if they're able to establish cover in principle. And what the court said was that trends clauses must not be construed in a way which means that tr that um, the, the, the effect of the cover is taken away. So they need to be construed in a way which provides the benefit of the cover. And, and what the court said is that only trends which are unrelated to the insured peril can be taken into account. So in other words, COVID-19 related trends for the most part, shouldn't be taken into account in applying the adjustment to the turnover figure to arrive at, at the company's financial loss. And this is arguably one of the most significant parts of the judgment in relation to quantifying loss. And there's another similar clause which the court looked at, um, or, or, or aspect which the court looked at, which, is, which are pre-trigger losses. And in the period prior to announcements being made by the UK government, the effects of the of the emerging pandemic were already being felt by businesses. So looking at our bar in Glasgow, if their footfall, for example, was already starting to fall in the course of March, then that would have an impact on the comparator figure, um, which, which, is, which is being used to calculate their financial loss. You're already seeing less people going out for a drink. Um, and the court looked at whether these pre-trigger losses should be taken into account in calculating uh, in calculating the company's financial loss. Um, the FCA and the Hiscox appealed their aspect of the judgment from the High Court, which dealt with this. And the Supreme Court said that the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic prior to co cover being triggered shouldn't be taken into account in looking at the period afterwards. So again, that's an important aspect of the judgment. So before I embarrass myself by getting too far into what's the, the, the realms of calculation of financial loss, um, I'd like to, to, to bring in Hannah McDowell of EY um, to, to discuss some of the specific topics with her. Morning, everyone. Morning, Hannah. Delighted to have you join us today. Thank you for having me. 
an interesting time, I imagine, for you in, 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 in dealing with these these claims for clients. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and just really interesting to see the results of the judgment as well. I think some some were expected and hoped for and other parts um, less expected and a nice surprise. <laughs> absolutely. So what does all of this mean in practical terms for policyholders looking to prove loss um, if, if they've been able to establish cover in principle? Yeah, so, well, ultimately, um, the burden of proof falls on the policyholder. So now that we've got the judgment, um, those that have appropriate cover will need to identify their loss and then demonstrate that to their insurer. So to do that, policyholders will need to measure the impact of the business interruption on, um, on their business and then support it with appropriate documentation. Um, so if we refer, I'm going to refer back to Company X, it's a good example, so thank you, Andrew. Um, so in the case of Company X, um, it needs to be demonstrated that the closure of the bar resulted in a loss. Uh, prior to COVID, the company uh, generated 100% of its revenue through the sales of food and drink that were consumed on the premises. So that part of the business can no longer function. Um, and on this basis, and at very high level, Company X can calculate its loss of gross profit by deducting actual revenue earned through its new takeaway service um, from expected revenue before applying a standard rate of gross profit determined in the policy. Um, so to put themselves in the best position possible, Company X and, and all policyholders would need to pull together um, contemporaneous documentation that supports their claim. So good examples of this would be um, monthly management accounts that illustrate historic sales um, and support the amounts that they've actually earned during the interruption period um, and invoices perhaps that support increased costs of working. So um, in the case of Company X, that might be um, increased costs associated with um, updating the company's website to facilitate online orders, perhaps. Um, and the better supported the claim and the claim assumptions, then really the faster that the claim is going to be resolved. So what effect does the, um, the but-for scenario, the, the usual test in, in, in many claims, what effect does that have in practical terms? So the Supreme Court's determined that the but for or our expected scenario is one in which COVID did not happen at all. So this is a huge benefit to policyholders. Um, so previously it was suggested that the but for scenario would be based on businesses' performance in the weeks immediately prior to the government restrictions. So this was the time when government had begun to advise the UK population. Um, that advice had started to influence influence customer behaviours um, and as a result businesses had started to see a downturn um, and depressed levels of sales. So on this basis the losses um, for which the policyholders are indemnified would have been much smaller. Um, so the result of the Supreme Court's decision, um, a reasonable but for scenario could be one that is based on the same period in the prior year. So we're looking at perhaps um, the March to July period in 2019 or an average of 2018 and 2019, that would now be a reasonable but for period, one where COVID doesn't exist. And what about trends clauses? What factors will be taken into account in, in, in looking at the adjustments which are relevant under, under trends clauses? So the court determined that the trends clause um, is sh should be construed as meaning trends unrelated to the insured peril. So the insured peril is COVID. Um, ordinarily, we would look at a combination of budgets, um, historic sales performance, and then wider market trends and competitor performance. So because of the nature of the pandemic, um, there are no markets or competitors that haven't been affected. So policyholders are really going to need to rely on those budgets and the historic sales performance. Um, that being said, many policyholders will have now prepared budgets on the basis that COVID exists. They will have taken that into account. Um, and in this case, policyholders will need to consider what their business could have reasonably achieved in a non-COVID world. Which is, at the moment, quite a challenging exercise. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what can businesses do to, to strengthen their position on quantifying loss? So we touched on this um, a little bit before, but basically yeah. the most important thing is to collate as much documentation as possible. So insurers are going to want to test the assumptions that are made in preparing the claim. So policyholders need to be able to demonstrate that um, the decision, why they made decisions, what those decisions were, um, when they made them, um, and basically support them as much as they can. So claims are not going to be taken at face value. Um, and anywhere that there is a significant deviation from historic trends, from past performance, insurers are going to want to take a, a closer look. 
um, and they're going to want to see how this position can be supported. So if in the case of Company X, um, they had projected revenue growth um, between 2019 and 2020 of, um, let's say, 8%, the insurers are going to want to know why they had expected that growth. So perhaps they were extending their opening hours. So um, how can we support that? Um, is there a press release that's, that shows that um, the date of the announcement? Um, what contemporaneous documentation have we got that supports that claim? And a common question we've had um, coming across is, 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 is what impact um, should government support such as furlough payments have? How are they taken into account in calculating loss? So this is going to vary between insurers. Um, so how we treat the, the government support scheme. So furlough is a good example. Um, the FCA asked insurers to assess the appropriateness of making deductions for some or all of each type of government support that's been received. So. Um, we've also seen um, a letter from the Treasury to the Association of British Insurers asking insurers not to deduct the benefit of government support from claims. Um, now, this is on the basis that that does not reflect the spirit in which the government provided that support. That was there um, in an emergency to help businesses continue to function. Um, and for policyholders whose insurers are deducting government support, because we've seen um, in the in the response to that letter that um, some insurers have agreed and others haven't. So we're going to see a variety of responses. But for policyholders whose insurers are deducting the government support, um, it will be as a saving from the claim. Um, this will be equal to the amounts received. So if Company X had received um, £10,000 for furloughing its staff, then £10,000 would be included in savings along with um, overheads, etc., and that would then be deducted from the claim total. Thanks. Um, sorry, and then with business rates relief, because that's a slightly different one. Um, yeah. so my understanding is at the moment that with business rates relief, um, insurers are treating this as a genuine saving. So, where the policy indemnifies the policyholder for a loss of gross profit, the wording most likely says. Um, that they will be covered for a loss of gross profit, less savings. And this means that insurers are going to assess the loss of gross profit suffered by the business. And then from that amount, they will deduct the total business rates that were saved during the loss period. So the, 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 there is some good news on that front. Um, just uh, we will deal with questions at the end, but there's one which has come through on, on the, the chat function that we, we could perhaps just pick up on this conversation. Um, Hannah, someone is asking, um, is quantum always based on turnover as opposed to profit? Um, is that um, well, when calculating the loss of gross profit, the typical way that we would do it is to take expected revenue, less actual revenue, and then you apply the, the rate of gross profit. You wouldn't do expected gross profit, less actual gross profit. Yeah. So just to round up, I, I think um, something that will be prevalent in, in, in many businesses' minds at the moment is how do you deal with multiple interruption periods and, and, and various different occurrences against a background where the Supreme Court judgment is really only looking at, 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 at the March um, the, the March instructions from the UK government? Yeah, so it's going to, oh, sorry, <clears throat> it will be interesting. Um, I think at the moment it sounds like insurers are just focusing on the claims from the first lockdown. And that's where we're going to see the vast majority of claims. So that was roughly late March to mid July last year. Um, and then obviously we've had two further lockdowns and the tier systems. So policyholders that have gone through um, renewal already um, since the first lockdown are very likely to have found that. COVID is now excluded um, and so they're not going to be able to claim for any additional lockdowns or restrictions um, but those policyholders whose renewal is let's say February or around now um, they will have sat through three separate lockdowns and potentially it will depend on specific policy wording but potentially there could be um, claims for three separate lockdown events. Mm -hmm. Yeah and but at the moment um, we, we haven't really seen very much of that playing through into claims being paid out. Yeah. Well, Hannah, I think we'll, we can leave it there for the moment. There are some questions coming through, which we might try to, to deal with at the end if there's time, but, but thank you very much. There's a, there's a lot of food for thought there. Um, so to look at this from a broker perspective, I'm going to hand back to, to Andrew, who's going to, to have a chat with Sam Ellerton from Lockton. Thanks, Ashley. And uh, Sam, thank you very much for joining us today. It's, it's great to have you along. Um, your uh, title is Regional Claims Leader and Senior Vice President claims so can i assume it's been a busy busy old year for you 
Yeah, it's certainly has. Very busy indeed. Um, probably one of the um, the busiest kind of 10, 12 month periods that we've we've undergone as a claims team. Um, so um, yeah, obviously uh, immediately after March, we spent an awful lot of time reviewing vast numbers of policy wordings, and we've been keeping very close uh, closely appraised of the High Court action. Supreme Court result and um, and how that uh, how that's played out for our policy holders. Great. Great. And maybe you could just give us a bit of um, an example of, of being on the claim side of a broker, what, what your role is for your clients. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we actually, a lot of we very much kind of have a very legally led claims department. So in that sense, um, I'm, a, I'm a practicing solicitor. A lot of my team are, are lawyers as well. Um, and in that respect, it's it's obviously undertaking a pretty thorough policy review and applying the the facts of a particular insurer's case to that policy, and ultimately robustly challenging insurers, um, which it's fair to say has been very much required, um, particularly in in respect of certain markets, um, to really try and, and drill home and get the absolute best results for clients wherever possible. And inevitably, in a in a with an issue such as this, where you have a lot of complexity. Um, it really is important to take a very technical approach with uh, with the insurers because they will inevitably throw um, pretty much everything back at you as a claims department to try and uh, convince you that there's no cover under your client's policy learnings. Okay. And what was your experience of, of how um, prevalent or, or otherwise specific pandemic cover was before COVID-19 yeah. kicked off? Probably not prevalent at all, really. Um, I'm yet to see in all of Lockton's clients anybody who bought a specific pandemic policy. Um, uh, but interestingly, uh, also, I'm uh, only seeing in one, maybe two policies a specific pandemic exclusion. And I think ultimately this is where the whole case has arisen from. Um, you know, I think it's probably fair to say that most insurers wouldn't have contemplated their wordings covering people for losses resulting from a global pandemic you know insurance generally only works as a concept if the, the premiums of the many pay for the claims of the few but ultimately they should have written that into their wordings and and what's resulted is um uh, lawyers claims handlers and, and everyone else driving a, a horse and cart through some of the wordings which frankly when you read them um quite clearly provide cover for for this type of loss um, and with all due respect to the insurers, it doesn't matter what their intention was. It, it matters what the contract says. So, yeah, in that respect, um, I think uh, inevitably this, um, this this issue is going to run and run because um, what's what's happened here is that insurers have allowed huge numbers of very different property damage business interruption wordings to uh, get out into the market. Some of them uh, have more than a hundred different policy wordings. And frankly, I think some of them have lost track as to exactly what they are covering and what they're not covering. And that has, if I'm honest, led to a lottery uh, whereby uh, it doesn't matter how much you've paid in premium. Uh, we've seen clients who've paid very small amounts in premium with, with quite significant claims. Uh, and um, uh, the opposite to that in that we've got clients who have paid uh, multi-million pound premiums who have absolutely no cover whatsoever for the pandemic. Okay. Okay. Um and I'm going to address a question that's been sent on, on the private feed here. Sorry to ambush you with that, but a, a lot of the right. commentary, um, a lot of the commentary, whether in the press or, or, or even today, we've been speaking about refers to SMEs. Um, but do the comments apply, you know, across industry uh, as well as to SMEs? Yes, very much so. So the FCA test case was designed ultimately to focus on SMEs because, quite rightly, the FCA, FCA identified SMEs as being the, the most vulnerable to the losses sustained by the pandemic. However, of course, this is a UK um, Supreme Court judgment. Uh, it doesn't refer just to SMEs. It will refer equally to a business of any size. So in that respect, um, I can assure you our, our global multinationals were as interested in this judgment as our SME clients. Um, and the, the resulting principles are going to be as applicable across the board for, for every type of insured. Okay. okay, thanks, Sam. And um, you mentioned that um, in, in progressing claims, there's been you know, quite strong resistance um, to paying those claims. Have you seen that resistance soften at all after round one in the High Court and now very recently around two in the, in the Supreme Court? 
Yes, I think I think certain markets now have um, have accepted um, the um, the results. Um, you know, particularly um, the likes of QBE, RSA, AXA um, are, are taking quite proactive steps now to bring claims to conclusion, um, which is is a sensible decision, frankly, in view of the fact that they have nowhere to go after the Supreme Court decision or some of their broader wordings. And ultimately, if they are slow to settle those claims, it leaves insureds um, open to taking legal advice, of course, the cost of which they may well recover from the insurer. Um, so, yeah, in, in that sense, we are very much seeing some traction now after the Supreme Court's um, decision. That being said, there are still markets holding out, particularly on those types of wordings where they weren't directly considered in the FCA test case. So particularly wordings that require the disease to be at premises being being the big one where we're still having quite um, fervent and robust arguments with with different insurers. Okay. Without betraying any client confidence, obviously, can you maybe give us a bit more detail about, about what that argument is about? Is that yeah, so, policy? Um, so, so if if you have a, a policy that requires the disease to be present at premises, um, I would be suggesting to any insurer that they should be reviewing those and considering, um, firstly, what type of cover is it? Is it a notifiable disease extension? which all you need to do is prove the disease at premises. In the same way as the FCA test case wordings require the disease to be proven within one mile or 25 mile of premises, or is it a hybrid wording which requires the disease to be at premises and resulting restrictions to be imposed upon the business? In both instances, you're not gonna get away from the fact that to trigger cover, you're going to have to evidence that someone was on your premises with COVID-19. But that doesn't mean necessarily you have to have a test result. That would be the best evidence, but ultimately you will at least need to have an argument, witness evidence perhaps, that suggests that an insured can prove that somebody was on site with symptoms and subsequently had to self-isolate. Um, and all the other thing really around that distinction around notifiable disease cover and hybrid cover, if you've got notifiable disease cover, the peril there is very much the disease. So you're covered usually for interruption or interference as a result of that disease. Therefore, once you have that, um, that occurrence on site, I would argue that there's absolutely no reason why your cover shouldn't respond in the same way as the, the wide vicinity disease cause is considered in the FC test case responded. In other words, um, once you've got it on site, that essentially is a uh, what's in law approximate concurrent cause of your loss, along with the government restrictions and the uh, public response to the pandemic. And so accordingly, you should be able to pursue a claim for all your COVID related losses once you have that trigger moment of someone being on your premises with the disease. If you've got the slightly more restrictive wordings, the hybrid wordings, uh, where you specifically require restrictions as a result of somebody at premises with disease, then you really need, it's a timeline issue there. So you need to show the Supreme Court said a causal chain. So you need to have somebody on site with disease. And then after that, in the timeline, you have to have some restrictions which are imposed upon your business and often require, if there's mention of things like inability to use, you're going to be required to show that you've either had a partial closure of your premises or a total closure of your premises which of course limits the types of insured that could potentially pursue claims. But I wouldn't give up in, if you've got those types of extensions. Ultimately, I would be digging around, finding any evidence I could that somebody had been at premises with the disease, and I'd really be pushing the argument with um, my insurer to make sure that um, I've done everything I possibly can to successfully recover uh, my claim from them. Okay, uh, thanks, Sam. So, so that sounds like one potential future um, battleground. Um, mm -hmm. Any thoughts on, on where future battlegrounds may lie on the coverage yeah, as, yeah, as, sure. as opposed to the quantum side? Yeah, so the, 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 the big issues that um, the FCA didn't deal with, and um, I suspect the reason was this, because they, they felt that the, the clauses they took to the High Court and Supreme Court were the best of the best, the ones that most likely uh, would most likely had some cover. But of course, there was an inevitable um, huge amount of uh, issues around the sides of the, the, the FCA test case, which weren't addressed directly. Um, the big ones being, particularly as you, uh, we just discussed, uh, wordings that require the disease to be at premises. The second is property owners policies, where there's um, loss of rental income cover. Um, the third is any issues of aggregation. So this is where you have multiple locations with different limits, and it's how 
um, individual successful claims would, whether they, the limits would apply to the whole group of um, locations or individual locations. And also the, the other one, which is the, um, whether COVID-19 is capable of causing property damage in law, which of course, if it would, is capable of causing property damage in law, that could potentially open up claims for a, a myriad of insureds on relatively basic property damage business interruption cover. Okay, so watch this, watch this space. Um, Indeed, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm sure there will be further. This is this is um, this is the first battle in a war, and I suspect um, it's it's. I would be reasonably surprised if if we we're getting anywhere near a conclusion by the end of 2022. I, I do suspect that there will be policyholders out there who have um, enough skin in the game and high enough limits that they will take legal advice and pursue legal cases. And of course, one thing to note is that in the FCA's DSEO letter recently, it did make reference that um, where others wish to take test cases, insurers generally should be agreeable to covering an insured's legal costs, but also not seek their own legal costs if they're unsuccessful. And potentially this gives a bit of a, a free hit to uh, insureds where they wish to pursue arguments which weren't considered by the FCA test case. Whether, of course, and to what extent insurers uh, listen to that letter from the FCA is another matter entirely, but certainly in view of the public relations exercise that a lot of insurers are now undertaking, um, I think it would be a brave insurer who said that they weren't prepared to, uh, to listen to the FCA guidance. Okay, okay. Uh, and if the Supreme Court was was um, not at the end. Of course, it doesn't mean that insurers won't succeed in other arguments. Of course, and and every every yeah. every dispute's got to be considered on its own on its own terms and its Indeed. own wording. Yeah. yeah, and this is it. I mean, at the end of the day, there there are some there's some clauses now that we can pretty distinctively say there are cover, and some clauses we can pretty distinctively say there are definitely no cover uh, as the law stands today. But there is a big middle section whereby if you have a wording or you're required, um, you're, you're insured on a wording such as that, really you need to be taking expert advice to fully understand the implications of those wordings. Okay, thanks, Sam. So last question before we maybe deal with some of the questions that have come on the chat function, is that um, can I assume that the, the availability of pandemic cover now is, is non-existent or, or need enough yes yeah so um in the vast majority of policy wordings i've seen for the present policy unsurprisingly insurers have put ironclad communicable disease exclusions in there um not surprising of course um specifically relating to covid19 there are a number of markets out there potentially considering uh, parametric solutions um, a bit like uh, Paul Ree, um types of solutions around uh, uh, pan future pandemic cover. But as I say, it, it, and it, it only works if, if it only happens occasionally. If insurers have to pay out for a very large number of very large claims regularly, then it doesn't work because the premiums will become inevitably so high that nobody would be interested in buying it in the first place. So in that sense, I don't think it's a major priority for the market. I think if there was to be a pandemic policy tomorrow, um, uh, whilst a lot of people may be interested in it, I suspect the premium requirements would would preclude many insureds being interested in actually taking that cover out. Okay, thanks, Sam. That was all really, really helpful to hear. And um, that has now taken us to, to the forty five minutes allocated for this. And um, we've had loads of questions come in. Some on the public chat, some on the in the private chat. We're not going to be able to get to them all just due to time constraints. But I would propose to to deal with some of them now. If people are happy to stay and listen to those questions, that's great. Equally, if your diaries are full and need to hang off, that is also fine. And if so, thank you for joining. Um, I'm very happy to quarterback the questions, which mean I don't have to answer them. So, uh, first of all, one one of the questions I'll I'll direct to Hannah, if I can, is. Um, Using the golf club example that the Supreme Court referenced, um, that that is a, a business that's had to uh, close part of its premises, the clubhouse, but but keep open the the, the golf playing part of its business. Um, would the club be able to claim for loss of income on the basis visitors weren't permitted to travel to the club and therefore reduce numbers? You know, in line with government guidance on on travel, for example. That's an interesting one, actually, um, because presumably if people aren't allowed to travel to the club, um, 
Is it because it's a hotel as well? Because presumably if they're not allowed to travel to the club, then the club would be closed anyway. Well, I think well, in Scotland, at least you've had restrictions on travelling between different local authorities, for example. So if I wanted to play golf in, in Fife, which is across the, the bridge from me, I wouldn't be allowed to do that, even though the golf course would be open. So they would have a, a loss of income from travelling golfers such as myself. Yeah, well, I think um, on that basis, potentially, but it would all come down to specific policy wording. Um, we like really need to dig into the detail on that one. Thanks. And I suspect a lot of the answers to the questions we've received would, would be specific policy wording specific. Um, Ashley, if you're able to do one of the questions which relates to um, government support and the ABI's response to that. That's, that's fine. I, I think the, I think um, the ABI have got, have got a, a question in the uh, public function and we've also had um, a, a, I think a very fair comment um, just to pick up on something that, that, that Hannah said about the government support and government grants. Um, the ABI responded to the Treasury, um, the Treasury position in, in a letter on the 25th of September, um, and that letter sets out 12 insurers who have said that they will not be taking specific government grants into account. Um, so the 12 insurers um, are, are listed in the letter, um, but th th there is certainty, and the ABI have put forward that certainty, that those, that those particular insurers um, will not be deducting local authority grants and other small business grants. Um, so for at least some insurers and some policies, there is certainty on that front in quantifying claims. Um, I don't, I, I didn't take Hannah's, Hannah's comments to be a, a sort of insurer bashing comment. And, and just in case uh, the EBI, I think that's what we're doing. Um, we're flagging some uncertainty, but um, they are quite rightly pointing out here that, that some insurers have already confirmed their position on that front. Um, Angie, I can actually pick up a couple of the other comments uh, from, from our chat function. We've had some specific questions which are which are likely to turn on policy. Um, for example, uh, will, will premises cover outdoor spaces? Um, well, that will, again will, will very much depend on policy wording. Um, we've had a question about whether there are time limits for making claims under the policy. Again, that that is a, a policy wording specific question. Um, that's a, that's a question from for for whether a liquidator um, is it, worth looking at a policy. And again policy wording specific. Um, we've had another question just come through on the regulatory and conduct implications um, for brokers advising clients. That's a, a very wide question which we might <laughs> deal with separately if that's okay. Um, we have a question on the public chat function about quantum and turnover, Hannah. I think you dealt with that one. Um, yeah, I think we dealt with that one. Um... But yeah, but the standard um, calculation would be to do um, expected turnover, less actual turnover, and then yeah. apply the rate of gross profit. At the moment, given that we have a lot of questions coming through, if, if we haven't covered them in, in, in this discussion just now, we, we will come back to you separately to cover off the points. I'm, I'm afraid it's, it's difficult to field all of the questions just at the moment. Okay, well, I think, um... Given we've we've gone over time again, I'd like to thank both of um, Al, um, Sam, and Hannah today for contributing. Thank you all for joining. I hope you found that um, relevant and of interest. Um, it's a 114-page judgment. Um, it, it's, it's technical. It, it's dry in parts, um, and, and so some of this has been uh, inherently high level and slightly general, but hopefully applicable enough for you to take away some some useful useful outcomes. Thanks again. For my part, thank you to, to our speakers and thank you to everyone for joining us.